Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the last day of this uh, summer school. Um, our first speaker is uh, Carmen Pin. Dr. Pin is a senior director in systems in the systems medicine team of the clinical pharmacology safety science at AstraZeneca in Cambridge, United Kingdom. And prior to joining to AstraZeneca in 2018, she led the computational gastrointestinal biology group at the Quadram Institute Biosense in Norwich. She studied veterinary medicine and also did uh, her PhD in veterinary science and later took full undergraduate degrees in statistics and mathematical statistics. Carmen has co-authored numerous scientific articles and led some um, substantial scientific research projects funded by the European Union and the BBSRC of the United Kingdom. So um, welcome, uh, Carmen, the, the floor is yours. So I would like to, uh, I'm not sure if we can interact, uh, uh, but uh, well, I will try to, to if, if you have any question, or I, I'm not sure if uh, you could ask uh, for a microphone and interrupt uh, me, but that, 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 that would be, I mean, if uh, that's uh, possible, uh, that, that would be great uh, during the talk that uh, we, we chat a little bit. I mean, that is not only me just telling you for an hour what we are doing, but that uh, I can have uh, your, your feedback. So why do we need um, a models in biology? In, well, biology is uh, very dynamic. Uh, even when it seems it's not changing, uh, everything is changing, but it's um, in a way that everything is stable. So, so what this means is that uh, when we um, approach a biological system, uh, we have uh, many moving parts interacting with each other. And this is something very challenging for us to put together all these uh, moving parts um, and how they interact with each other in our mind is really difficult. Um, so for, for, for this uh, reason, to, to do this, to achieve uh, this integration of uh, dyna dynamic parts, uh, we, we have uh, mathematical models. Um, and so uh, these mathematical models can summarize all these uh, dynamics and different parts moving together and interacting with each other and help us understanding um, what are the outputs, what are the inputs, uh, and, and how the system is working. Uh, so we, we can have very different um, behaviors in these dynamic systems. And uh, for, for instance, uh, in the case of, uh, let me see if I can use the, the laser point. So in the case of uh, populations like the polar birds, in, well, we know that the, if nothing changes, the, the populations uh, are more or less stable. And this can be modeled uh, with this uh, simple logistic uh, models in which uh, you have a population that increases and then it reaches a number in which uh, it's in balance uh, with, the, with the medium, so with the current capacity of the medium. So and once it's there, the population, the number of the population varies a little bit from, from one year to the other, but uh, it remains stable. Um, a very different uh, situation is, for instance, these uh, links and herd populations. No? In this case, we have a prey-predator uh, system in which uh, the links it's uh, hairs, so when the links increases, uh, the links is the, the red one, this is data, the, link, the, the hairs are going to decrease because they are eaten, eaten by the links. But when the hairs decreases, the links also has to decrease because uh, it, it, it is not going to find uh, uh, food. So we have uh, these two systems um, oscillating uh, with each other, I mean, these two quantities, uh, the prey and the predator numbers, uh, they depend on each other and they are oscillating uh, in, the, in, the, in the environment. They, they are very different, these dynamic systems. No one is a steady state, the other one is an oscillatory system, uh, but both uh, can reach equilibrium. Uh, that means that um, they, they will be, in this case, they, they are stable. The equilibrium is stable. There are other systems in which the equilibrium, the equilibrium is uh, unstable, but in, in this case, stable. So um, 
some, some, so, so we have systems with uh, many different uh, behaviors, and one of the most interesting uh, behaviors is uh, this uh, chaotic uh, uh, behavior, this uh, chaos theory that uh, started with uh, either um, Edward Lawrence uh, when he was uh, modeling um, the climate. Uh, uh, the, the, he was uh, forecasting the, the weather, and then uh, just uh, by chance uh, he discovered that uh, very small uh, changes in the code, uh, rounding errors in the computer, were cause, causing uh, very big um, uh, changes in the output of the predictions. Um, so, so what uh, he discovered was uh, that uh, well, uh, you you have um, uh, a system um, and a very very small input changes um, so that uh, should uh, practically um, drive a very, very small output change, it change completely the behavior of the system, not only the, the quantity or the prediction uh, level, but the, the complete behavior, the, what is uh, from um, uh, being a steady state to be an um, oscillation or so. So I will show you how, how this uh, works. Um, and, and that was uh, extending, to, well, the, this chaotic behavior was uh, later found also in, in many biological systems. And one of them is this um, um, population, this biological population that are the cicades. You know, the cicades are, uh, is this animal. And uh, one peculiar, peculiarity on, on this uh, population is that the generations don't overlap. Uh, that means that the, the cicades uh, vary the, the, the eggs of the next uh, generation, and those um, eggs um, emerge only in, in, in 13 or 17 years. So this, um, this type of population then can be modeled with uh, what is called a logistic uh, difference equation that is similar to the logistic uh, differential equation. Uh, sorry, I think my camera has stopped working. I want to see if I can restart it now. So these cicades, um, is, so the, the idea is that you can model these cicades with a logistic difference equation. It's a discrete uh, equation. And in that equation, if um, you have a low, uh, slow growth, you can see that the behavior is, as we described, uh, first an increase until you reach the current capacity of the environment, and then a steady state. If you increase the proliferation of that, um, or you decrease the, the, this um, emergency time, uh, the proliferation of uh, proliferation rate of uh, the population, what you get are um, a population with uh, stable behavior, but uh, cyclic uh, behavior. It's, uh, you, you, you have um, constant oscillations oscillations that are repeated over time. And as you increase um, more the, 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 the growth, um, the proliferation rate of the population, uh, these oscillation, oscillations will remain stable, but um, uh, they have more than two uh, stable points. Uh, but there is a point in which uh, you keep increasing this uh, proliferation rate, and what you see is uh, an, unpredictable, an unpredictable pattern of oscillations or changes in the in the population, and that's what is called chaotic behavior. That means that uh, well, you you get here a peak, then you get another peak, then it goes down. But uh, as you can see, there is no pattern in this um, in these changes. And, and that's what is called chaos. So the, the same system, the same, um, um, the same uh, sim the simple uh, deterministic model, uh, depending on the value of one parameter, it uh, can have uh, many different um, structures or can describe many different uh, behaviors. So after this, um, this after this, uh, after this uh, discover uh, by, by uh, Lawrence and May, uh, chaotic uh, fluctuations can, uh, were, were, have been detected in many other uh, biological systems, like uh, the, the heartbeat uh, um, intervals, the cardiac system, or also the neuron uh, firing intervals in the cortex. So it's quite a common um, um, dynamics in biology. So also a mathematical model um, help uh, reveal how uh, a, the uh, neuronal electrical impulses uh, are transmitted um, in the cortex. So and this was the work of uh, Hodgkin and Huxley. I don't know if you know Huxley was uh, well a very important scientist in the 30s, 40s. Well, uh, 
He got the Nobel Prize for his work together with uh, Hodgkin. But also Huxley was um, very interesting because he was uh, the brother of Aldous Huxley. And, and Aldous, his brother, uh, wrote uh, this um, um, this book uh, that was very famous uh, in, uh, at that time that is called Brave uh, New World. And uh, well, it's uh, it's a, book, a futuristic uh, science fiction um, war, um, book uh, describing a future society. So it's, it's quite interesting to read it because it describes how um, the society would be in the 90s. Uh, the, the book was written in, in the 30s, I think. So and it's, it's quite interesting to, to see that uh, he got right many things. You know, it's, 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 well, it's in, in the hindsight, it's, it's a nice book uh, to, to read. But uh, well, that's not the... The, 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 our, our presentation today is about something different and it's about the, his brother Huxley who together with Hodgkin what they did was measuring the membrane potential in, in the giant uh, squid axon you know, in this uh, big animal. And uh, so what they did uh, was uh, using mathematical models, using equations, uh, they could um, uh, describe um, a hypothesis, and it was uh, a hypothesis uh, comprising four independent uh, ionic channels. And with that, they were able to describe the data they were recording in this um, in, in the membrane of um, the giant uh, squid axon. I, I, um, so, so this was um, quite interesting because they got the Nobel Prize, but also they started uh, all a, a new theory in uh, ionic uh, dynamics. So um, ion channels uh, have uh, been studied very much in detail since then. Uh, for their study, you really need modeling because this one of those systems that you cannot really handle in your only with data in your mind or with simple operations. You need uh, um, differential equations. And um, well, this this work is the base of the current um, 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 ionic um, studies uh, um, of the current uh, studies of the current uh, uh, theory in ionic uh, dy dynamics and also in electrophysiology, uh, both in the heart and in the uh, nervous system. Uh, another uh, important discoverment, uh, discovery that it was uh, based on um, uh, mathematical modeling, for which mathematical modeling was really important, is um, the circadian rhythm. So we know that um, there's a circadian rhythm, we understand that, because we know that uh, we go to sleep at night and we are awake um, uh, during the day, and many of our um, physiological activities are also regulated in this way, they change from day to night. Uh, what uh, uh, what um, this uh, this group of people, Hall, Rosbars, and, and Young, um, help to understand is that this circadian rhythm um, is, is uh, can be coupled with uh, the light, but it's independent of the light. I mean, you have um, uh, these cycles of behavior of all physiological activity, even if you are in a complete uh, darkness uh, situation condition, and that's because you have. Um, um, group of proteins uh, oscillating in, in a timely manner, in a very organized timely manner. And then they discovered this group of proteins and that they were mainly re regulated or these oscillations, these stable oscillations over time, uh, were uh, mainly regulated by this uh, transcription, uh, translation feedback loop, in which, uh, well, they, they name uh, two main proteins called uh, period and timeless. And when they are uh, translated and transcribed, when they are synthet synthesized, they form a complex that inhibit their own translation. And that um, this feedback loop is um, essential for the uh, oscillatory behavior of this system. Um, so it's very complex uh, system, and there are a, uh, there's a big variety of uh, models uh, to describe it, uh, from uh, very simple to much more uh, complex, uh, depending on how many elements uh, they consider. But uh, well, the, the mathematical modeling is, is really mathematical models are really essential to understand and handle this this kind of, of system. So now I would like to uh, so so we are talking about modeling and um, I am talking about well equation and systems that are complex. So uh, what is this type of modeling about? Well, it's about uh, 
understanding the law of the systems and describing those laws um, with um, a computational um, algorithm or with a um, set of differential equations. Uh, so, but the, the basic is uh, the basis of, um, of this activity, of this modeling activity, is, is understanding the laws is, um, to, to develop these models. So, so a little bit, I, I brought here this video um, that is a part of a lecture in physics uh, by Richard Feynman. I don't know if you know him, this um, also Nobel Prize in Physics, um, a very, very uh, clever man. And um, well, there are many books, um, there are many, many seri serious um, um, papers about his work, but also a kind of uh, popular books um, about uh, his tricks um, because he, he was a great personality, not, not only professionally, but also a good, very good lecturer and quite a, a funny man. And then I would like to share with you this video, see if I can play it. Uh -huh. In general, we look for new law by the following process. First, we guess it. <laughs> yeah, then we com well, don't laugh. That's the really true. Then we compute the consequences of the guess to see what, if this is right, if this law that we guessed is right, we see what it would imply. And then we compare those computation results to nature. Or we say compare to experiment or experience compare it directly with observation to see if it, if it works. If it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. In that simple statement is the key to science. It doesn't make a difference how beautiful your guess is. It doesn't make a difference how smart you are who made the guess or what his name is. If it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. That's all there is to it. So I, I don't know. Just uh, just in case, if you didn't, uh, you, you couldn't listen very very well. Very well what, what he says is that the way to to go on about this model development is or this um, understanding the, this this type of uh, laws governing the this dynamic systems is that first uh, you guess what's happening. What, what's the, the main law um, driving the process, and then you compute it, uh, and then you, you, you get some predictions, and you compare predictions with observations. And if they don't agree, the model is wrong. And that's, uh, and, and although that, uh, when, when I, when he's saying that, or when I, I say that, uh, you, you may think, uh, well, it's uh, so common sense, and why, why do we need to listen to this? The truth is that uh, when you are working, uh, that's a very, very common um, situation in which uh, the modeler um, doesn't want to admit that his model is wrong and they blame the data or the experimental error or that they need more data or that. Uh, so so, so it, these, are, these are kind of uh, funny situations when, when you are uh, working. So let me now, um, I don't know if uh, I will be able to get um, some kind of input uh, from you, but this is uh, a small exercise um, about uh, just to show you why do we need uh, quantitative models in biology. One, um, one reason is what we have been speaking, no? what we have been saying, um, some processes are extremely complex. Uh, so you cannot really put in your mind all those moving parts together and the interaction between them and get an output without a computer because your mind doesn't, is not able yet to do those things. But another reason is that even for simple processes, um, uh, quantitative, uh, quantitative models can be extremely helpful. And uh, so let me show you an experiment. Uh, this is an experiment that um, um, Amos Versky and uh, Daniel Cunningham, Cunningham um, um, uh, did. In, um, uh, it was an um, uh, experiment, a uh, so, uh, social experiment, um, using um, uh, university students. What they did was asking the students uh, what, what is a more probable uh, event. Uh, the Linda, Linda is a um, person is a bank teller or that Linda is a bank teller and is active in the feminist movement. So now I would like you to vote 
and in a way say, I, I don't know if I can get any um, feedback from you. At this moment, I cannot see you. Just to, for, for instance, uh, hands up who think uh, that uh, the more probable event is that Linda is a bank teller. So I cannot see you, so I don't know. And hands up uh, the one that uh, the, the people that thinks, uh, think that Linda is a bank teller and is active in the feminist movement, this uh, case too is uh, more probable. So, well, um, I cannot see you, but then uh, let's go to the um, to why I'm talking about this very yeah. simple uh, th thing. There were 10 hands for number uh, one, no? For, and for number and, uh, two? For for number two, nobody. <laughs> nobody, okay. So you are, a <laughs> that's very good. That means that this course was excellent because yes, that's the right answer, of course. I mean, and that means that you are probably uh, quanti uh, quantitative people. I mean, you have quantitative minds because it's true that uh, um, Linda is a bank teller is more probable because this, is, uh, this uh, set will be included in, in, in the set of events uh, that, uh, I mean, it's, it's much, much more probable that Linda is only a bank teller that if you make a, you, we put another condition, then we are restricting the, the, the probability. No? So, of course, it's um, more probable, however, when, uh, Amos and Daniel, uh, and Daniel uh, made this experiment um, in, uh, among university, university st uh, students. Uh, what they found was that uh, most of university students uh, thought uh, that uh, the option two uh, was uh, more probable. And they thought that because this was more appealing to them because their perception was, well, Linda is a bank teller and active in the feminist movement. It's like uh, Linda is more real, is more of a real person. So the, the thing is that our perception is biased. Oh, sorry, our perception is biased. And one of the things that um, is not biased is a mathematical model. I mean, if you can quantify the, the events, you can see that this, um, um, uh, this set of events is much bigger than that one, than the second set of events. So because this set of events is much smaller and in fact it, uh, inside the, the set of events, the number one, uh, it will be uh, much less probable. So, so if you can, uh, that's in a probabilistic way. There are many other ways to quantify what is more probable. And if you quantify, you will always uh, get uh, the right answer. If you don't, and you just uh, let uh, your perception tell you or your, or what, the, what we say, your intuitive thinking tell you what is uh, more probable, you may, be, you may be wrong. I, I heard something in the, is there any question or any? Okay, we keep going. So now let me talk about modeling pharmacology because this has been a little bit of an introduction about models in general. So in pharmacology, the first thing is that we use a lot of empirical models. So far, we have been talking about mechanistic models, models that are describing the process, the mechanism or the main laws uh, driving the, the system. So empirical models are uh, just um, based on data. They describe data, they interpolate in the data. So if you don't have data, you don't have um, the model. Uh, mechanistic model, as, as uh, you have been seeing until now, or what I have described, is um, trying to understand what is the nuts and bolts uh, behind the process and implement uh, that in a computational or a mathematical way uh, to get predictions. So in the past, um, not, not so long, not uh, so long ago, but in the past, um, modelers, we, all of us, we, we were very proud to, to do mechanistic models, and we, in a, in a way, we were dismissive about empirical models because uh, practically it's um, data interpolation. You know, it's uh, the empirical functions with the shape of the data or um, interpolating between data and data between data points. Um, so, however, um, currently, uh, 
with uh, the introduction of artificial intelligence and the new technologies that generate uh, large data sets, we are uh, not uh, dismissive anymore because this has become a very, very important and essential uh, um, science uh, scientific field of uh, research field um, that, uh, well, this empirical modeling that now is uh, within artificial intelligence and machine learning is really important and it, uh, it has a huge impact uh, to understand um, large uh, data sets, so what information is in there. Uh, so, so still mechanistic models, of course, uh, we have um, better prediction performance um, and that means that we can extrapolate, we don't need the data. If we have a good model, uh, we, we can give predictions uh, um, for uh, situations in which uh, that we cannot measure and also we can investigate how the the process uh, works. Uh, we can test the uh, hypothesis, uh, what hypothesis match the data. Uh, however, uh, the, the new AI uh, and machine learning uh, algorithms are also very important um, to, to discover um, um, hypothesis is um, an information that is included in these very large uh, data sets that uh, we cannot uh, navigate. Now we have new technologies like omics, transcriptomics, proteomics. You get thousands of proteins and you practically are uh, um, flooded by the system. I mean, it's impossible to understand what the, to visualize uh, or, or uh, um, uh, just get the information in those data sets without uh, this type of um, um, of uh, te technology without uh, AI or machine learning. So we are not dis dismissive anymore about empirical modeling or uh, AI, in fact, uh, is, is quite important. So, but in the pharmaceutical industry, the traditional empirical models just based on the data are quite um, easy to produce or well, straightforward to produce once you have to, the, the data is still very much used. Uh, so let me show you first uh, here in this part, um, uh, what is the drug uh, development uh, pipeline? So what they do is, um, what we do in the companies is uh, just uh, select uh, the target, not those, uh, that molecule that we want to modify. For instance, if it is cancer, maybe we want to um, uh, inhibit a protein of the cell cycle, or maybe we want to disrupt uh, DNA synthesis during replication so that we disrupt uh, proliferation and we disrupt uh, cancer cells of uh, dividing. Um, then, uh, well, you generate a series of compounds with that activity uh, because they, there are um, this uh, chemical, um, there, there are several actually chemical possibilities to that. And then you just uh, optimize uh, that uh, chemistry and go to preclinical phases in which uh, you use um, in vitro and in vivo system, systems uh, to assess uh, the safety and the efficacy of, uh, of those compounds. And, uh, and after that is assessed and, and it's all um, green and good. Uh, green is because uh, well, it uh, doesn't have any issue. Uh, then you can go in clinical trials with real patients. So and, and during this pipeline, uh, we, we use modeling a lot. So one of the things maybe when you finish this course, you should have in mind is that the pharmaceutical industry can really offer uh, interesting jobs in modeling and in uh, numerical uh, approaches and, and good jobs. I mean, it's, 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 it's a good, um, it's, 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 it's a good um, uh, field to be in if um, you have a numerical uh, interest. Uh, so uh, this, uh, well, but uh, talking about again empirical models and AI. So, for instance, in, in target selection, AI algorithms are now very common to to, to identify um, new um, compounds or to design compounds that can um, affect a target, a molecular target. Um, so then during um, the lead optim optimization and the preclinical um, assessment of uh, drug safety and drug, and drug efficacy, there's a lot of empirical modeling just connected the exposure with the response. No, for instance, if you have a, a data in, in, in a preclinical species in rats or in monkeys, so you, you can connect uh, the dose uh, with the 
uh, response uh, that is either a toxicity response or an efficacy response. And also during the clinical phases, once you have the patient's data, it's also very common to, to get the data and to connect uh, exposure and uh, concentration of drug in plasma with the response. That means maybe the tumor uh, shrinking, how the tumor is, if it is um, oncotherapeutics, uh, how the tumor is uh, reducing, uh, or uh, with uh, toxicity, with adverse e events associated also with, uh, with the drug, uh, that in the case of cancer treatments, the adverse events are uh, quite um, remarkable. Uh, so it may be um, decrease of platelets, or it may be um, gastrointestinal events. So, and, uh, you can, so, so you can um, understand in a quantitative manner uh, how the drug is um, producing this efficacy or uh, toxicity endpoints. So when we talk about empirical modeling in, uh, in pharma, many, many times we say PKPD uh, approaches. Um, by that, we mean pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics approaches. And just to a uh, first explanation about uh, what we mean with that, well, pharmacokinetics relates um, is, is um, the process in which you relate the dose, um, the dose that you give to the to the patient, uh, with the drug tissue concentration. So it includes all these events of absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion of the drug. In a way, in a very simple way, pharmacokinetics is um, um, just um, um, embraces all those process, all those events. Um, uh, or, or the processes that um, uh, of um, that, that um, <laughs> well, the processes in which uh, the, the, what the body does to the to the drug. Now, that's the processes in which the body is doing that something to the drug, and what it's doing is either absorbing, distributing, metabolizing, or excreting the drug. So, and this uh, what we call uh, pharmacokinetics. Pharmacodynamics is what the drug does to the body. So once the drug is in the tissues, it's going to disturb, um, um, I mean, if it is an adverse effect, effect, it will disturb either the liver functionality or the GI functionality of the lung. If it is a, an efficacy activity of the drug, it, it will disturb the, the, the tumor growth, or maybe it will uh, correct um, a, a disease process, not something that is not working very well in the liver or in the kidney will be corrected by this drug. So we have a PK, what the body does to the drug, so that the drug comes into the body and starts being metabolized and cleared from the body. And PD, that is what the, um, what the uh, drug does to the body. I mean, how the, the drug that is in the tissues uh, is going to, to do in all these different systems and organs that we have. So also very important in the pharmaco in, in pharmacology is uh, to understand um, what is the effective concentration to achieve uh, what we want with that drug uh, and what is the toxic concentration, that concentration at which we start seeing uh, toxicity. So there's no, I, I don't know if you know the expression of um, everything depends on the dose. So depending on the dose, so if we, we give some, uh, some dose to a patient, you are going to have a concentration of that drug in plasma. So depending on that dose, uh, at the dose, at this dose that uh, we have um, in, the, in the blue line, what you can see is that uh, we are in a very good situation because we are above uh, defective concentration. So we are going to have uh, the, 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 the effect uh, that we are uh, um, targeting with this drug, but we are not reaching the toxicity concentration, so we are in a safe uh, region. And this is what is called the th uh, therapeutic margin. That is, you are above, um, you, you achieve efficacy, but you don't reach uh, toxicity. So, and this the, the basis of um, uh, this is very important in pharmacology before, maybe before you move to clinical trials, and, and even after you move to clinical trials, you need always to, to assess uh, this. Um, however, when, this, uh, when we, we do this type of um, assessment using uh, PKPD or empirical models, models that connect, uh, that need the data, uh, well, it's, it's not an optimal situation because first, 
we have a very limited predictivity because we, 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 we need the clinical data. So if you need the data to predict the data, your predictive ability is not great. And also the first clinical trials in which you don't have uh, data um, are quite um, dangerous in a way because uh, you will be you will base uh, these clinical trials on in vivo in in vitro data, but with this type of uh, models that uh, are empirical, just data they describe the data, uh, you may have uh, failures because uh, there are cross species differences and the models because they don't they just follow the data will not account for those uh, cross species differences. So and there have been very uh, big failures in clinical trials because of this type of approaches. So thing uh, for, uh, to, to assess this, uh, the safety and efficacy of, of drugs, that is this plot that uh, we were uh, looking at uh, in, the, in the previous slide, uh, we, we need to improve uh, this type of modeling and to uh, move from uh, these preclinical these clinical models to more mechanistic models that um, offer uh, uh, predictions uh, prior to the clinical trials. So in the, this could be the PK um, part, that part of which uh, you give the drug to the body and the body tries to get the rid of the drug that is called the PK part. And here uh, empirical, we have what uh, they call uh, empirical models are called PK models and more mechanistic are called uh, PBPK that uh, stands for physiological based pharmacokinetics. In what is called the PD part, the um, pharmacodynamics part in which uh, we have what the drug is doing to the body, know how to describe that. Uh, the empirical is called uh, PD models and the more mechanistic is now called quantitative systems pharmacology or quantitative systems toxicology models if they describe either efficacy or toxicity. So we are uh, trying to move from the empirical to the mechanistic in both um, in both parts, no, both in the PK and in the PD, and in the uh, distribution of the drug in the body and in the response of the body to the drug. This is an example of uh, how, big, um, how the comparison between uh, pharma PK versus PPK models. I mean, the PK are the typical models that just connect uh, data with. Uh, um, that, that just um, connect the data. And the PPK are models uh, more mechanistic uh, with a series of hypotheses and then with more predictive, uh, with better predictive uh, performance. But the, in both models are describing the tissue, con the tissue concentration dynamics after dosing a drug. Um, so it's uh, this that they will, uh, what the body is doing with the drug. So in the, in the empirical model, uh, usually we have just two compartments. One is central that represents usually the plasma and the other one peripheral. Sometimes even we have only one compartment. So they are very, very simple and uh, they are um, handled as uh, differential, ordinary differential equations and they are based on data. So you really need the clinical data to establish uh, this type of uh, model. For the PVPK model, well, it's a model in which uh, you consider uh, the administration of the drug, how the drug uh, distributes uh, through the different tissues, and it's metabolized by, by some of uh, these organs. So it's, uh, they are uh, complex models with multiple compartments, um, usually described by a large system of uh, differential equations, and then you, you need a computer to, the, to, to, to move all these um, different uh, systems uh, at the same time. But um, so it's more complex, but on the other hand, um, because it's based just in, in the patient's characteristics and in the drug properties, uh, you can predict the concentration of the drug in the body uh, before the clinical study starts, I mean, in advance. So, and that means that it's quite um, uh, much more powerful more difficult, more challenging, but more powerful. I mean, you have the chance to give a proper prediction. So we are in the same caves for the, for the pharmacodynamics part, not this PD versus um, QSP, QSD models, the organic response to the drug. Now that's what we are measuring. Um, what, the, what the organs, uh, what the drug does to the organs. Um, so when we have uh, empirical models, usually they just connect uh, the symptoms uh, with the concentration in plasma or sometimes even just with the dose. And uh, you have uh, closed forms, uh, differential equations, probabilistic models, I mean, 
but usually they are quite simple. Um, when we move to quantitative uh, systems models, what we try to, to understand or to describe with our models is the path, pathophysiology um, and, the drug, and the drug mechanisms function. I mean, how the drug enters in the cell, disturbs at the molecular level the DNA synthesis or a protein, and how that um, disturbance at the molecular level propagates uh, to the cell, to the tissue, to the, and to the body uh, to, to, to give a, a symptom. And we, we need to understand the dynamics at all the, these different, uh, these, uh, different uh, scales. Um, so they are much more complex. Um, still, we use uh, the same, the same uh, tools, again, differential equations, ordinary or partial differential equations. We can use also agent-based models, and also we can use um, AI elements or machine learning elements. Um, well, uh, the models are for efficacy in the sense that in this case, is, uh, if we want to correct uh, something that is not working in the, in the, in the body, or uh, we would uh, either um, disease because of um, lack of uh, signaling molecule or, or cancer, then we want to interrupt uh, proliferation. Uh, that would be the, the, the then we, we need to model all, all those processes and the organs and the, the molecular activity and how the organ is responding. I mean, toxicity is similar, toxicity or safety of drugs, uh, drug safety or toxicity are. are um, similar concepts. Um, and this can be on target if it is related to the mechanism of action. For instance, if you have cancer drugs and they inhibit proliferation in the tumor, they are also uh, inhibiting proliferation in other tissues. So that could be on target. Or it could be off target when suddenly that molecule that is supposed to interact uh, or to do with, with a given receptor and to do something very specific is also doing something else that you are not expecting. And this is uh, extremely difficult because you are not expecting this type of toxicity. And that's why um, the drugs during the preclinical assessment, they are run in big batteries of uh, in vitro and in vivo uh, platforms because uh, you want to be sure that there is, uh, that you know this part. Because the on target is expected, we can predict it, we can assess it. The off target is not expected, so this is extremely risky. So you, uh, from genetic mutations to, so, so you really need to assess that part. And then, well, uh, toxicity is uh, quite complex because we have multiple organs, multiple systems. And then what uh, we have is a, what is called a paradigm uh, shift from um, a scale uh, a specific um, um, approaches to multi-scale models. And that's because uh, when we want to model toxicity, um, we have multiple organs uh, with multiple space-time scales. So we are really in, in a complex uh, situation. So from molecular scale to the organism and the, the time scale also varies uh, extremely um, in, I mean, changes uh, dimension. So it's quite a complex system. And because of that, uh, the most common approach is uh, to work, uh, to, to develop this type of uh, um, big models, complex models, um, um, involving uh, multiple organs and systems, uh, what we do is um, organizing consortiums. And then this just to, to show the well, Transcuristi Consortium that just uh, finished uh, this year and uh, it was just trying to, the, the, the target uh, was to build mechanistic uh, quantitative models um, to support uh, um, key risk assessment decisions and to understand the safety of drugs in different organs. Uh, so the idea is if we know the PVPK of the drugs because of the properties of the drug, and we can understand how that, that drug um, is distribu distributed to the different organs, and we can see how they, we can quantify how the organs are responding to the drugs, uh, the kidney, the, the cardiac system, um, the GI, and the and the liver, uh, so and just by by understanding how the the molecular disruption in these organs of course by the drug, then we can give predictions uh, um, before we are ready to give predictions before the clinical trials start, and that's very important because the first time you dose a patient is critical because well things can get wrong, and uh, then you really need as uh, much uh, supportive. Um, um, 
considerations as possible to be sure that the dose you are giving to the patient in the first clinical trial is the right one and, and, you, and you don't have unexpected um, um, behaviors. So this is another consortium, um, and this um, just focus on, on organs. The previous consortium was big, just focus on many different organs. This one, uh, this uh, Dilisim, focus on your liver, uh, just uh, drug-induced liver injury, and just to be able to predict it in advance, and it's supported by the FDA, that, that is the Food and Drug Administration in the United States. States. And then we have also Renacim, that is another consortium, also to understand uh, kidney toxicity, the drug induced uh, kidney to uh, toxicity. This is very interesting because it's um, a cardiac uh, toxicity. And um, it's very interesting because, interesting because this is um, promoted by the um, uh, regulatory bodies. It's called a SIPA initiative. And then we know um, when I describe the models of um, um, Hodgkin's and Huxley, these electrophysiological uh, electrophysiology models, uh, well, these are the basis of the um, cardiac models. And uh, the idea is that uh, with uh, some in vitro uh, assessments, uh, you can uh, model uh, electrophysiology of the cardiac cells. And even you can understand the electrocardiograms uh, and how the electrocardiograms or the, ele um, uh, the electrical activity of the, of the heart is changing by the drug. So it all comes from these uh, ionic currents at the cellular level. If you understand how those ionic currents at the cellular level, level in the heart are disturbed, you can understand how the electrical impulses in the, in the heart, uh, across the heart, are going to be disturbed, and then the, how can you have arrhythmias. And this is something that you don't want in the drugs, so that we can predict it uh, with these models. Um, so this was also part of TransQST and this um, publication of a group in, in Oxford, in Oxford uh, working in these models. And uh, it's uh, so uh, important um, and so much work in this type of modeling that the regulatory bodies uh, are now accepting uh, models as proof of safety. No, it's, it's something, uh, and this type of QSD, uh, quantitative systems toxicology models are proof of, of safety. So you do the in vitro assessments, you, uh, with these in vitro measurements, you generate the, the predictions on the electrical activity of the heart. And this is something that the, the FDA and the EMEA, or the, the European uh, um, medicine agents, agent, agencies, uh, well, they are willing to accept and they are promoting this type of modeling. So this is very important for us because it means that uh, modeling is not only in the lab, it's also starting to, to cross the borders and be accepted by the, the people approving the drugs. So now I would like to, to discuss uh, the novel strategies to address, uh, to, to address um, uh, drug safety. And these uh, novel strategies are based on, uh, well, we have modeling. Um, if uh, we understand the whole process, uh, how the, the drug uh, disrupts uh, the body or the organs, uh, we can give predictions. But in many cases, we don't, um, because we don't. We know very, very little. That's the, the, the truth. No? We, we, we know practically, well, we know something, but uh, in the whole, uh, in, in the whole thing is, is little what we know. So it's difficult to develop these models that um, in biology that uh, can describe all the processes. So you need measurements. And measurements are usually obtained in vitro systems that are very simple or in animals. Uh, but animals are not so great because there are cross species differences. So what we have now are what is called advanced in vitro cellular systems. And uh, they are practically organs, uh, laboratory organs. I mean, from human stem cells um, with, um, because of, um, well, um, the differentiation of programming methods, but uh, you know that uh, we can really um, develop um, tissues and organs and, uh, in, in, in vitro um, in the lab. 
And this is very useful for toxicity assessment because suddenly you have a um, kind of, um, we, we call it organs on chips. Suddenly you have a chip um, that um, represents, recapitulates all the bone marrow functionality or the gastrointestinal functionality or the liver or the so, so and, and you can um, put drugs in the systems and see what is the response of the, of the organ. So uh, they are also, they have a large experimental capacity and then you, you can have, um, you can collect uh, multiple endpoints, uh, um, but also the most important uh, part is that they derive from, uh, so, so they are of human origin and that um, avoids the cross-species differences of responses. Uh, and because the drugs um, that we are generating today, they, they are very specific uh, at the molecular level. And, and there we have uh, many cross-species differences. Uh, molecularly, the rat and the human uh, are, not, uh, are very close, but not that close that, that we don't have uh, differences. So um, the problem that these systems have is that uh, the, the, the output is not always straightforward to understand in a clinical context. I mean, you have a chip, but it's not really the, the whole organ, you, you have um, hepatocytes uh, working more or less in an organized uh, way with each other. And then you measure the number of hepatocytes uh, that are dying. But how do you relate that um, number of hepatocytes with the liver injury in the patients? Because then in the clinic, uh, what you are going to measure is the um, production in plasma in plasma of a series of enzymes that uh, get elevated when you have uh, some problems in the liver. So how do you connect uh, this number of hepatocytes in my um, liver, in my chip, in my liver uh, chip with um, ALT elevation in, in patients? And, and there is where modeling has now a massive uh, role and is really trying to connect, uh, to put all those missing parts in the, in the way. No, if you damage hepatocytes, you will have a series of uh, processes that we can model so that you will have this elevation of um, enzymes in the patients. So um, the, the thing is that uh, and the main um, target uh, to, to do this type of uh, combination between uh, cell systems or uh, chip organs and, and modeling is because we want to increase uh, the safety of patients and also reduce animal experimentation. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry uses uh, animals, but uh, it's not really a, a choice. It's, it's something, uh, I mean, it's, it's not by choice. It's uh, because there's no uh, many other, uh, there's no other alternatives. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, uh, I think it's the um, industry doing the uh, investing the, the most uh, to replace these animals uh, because it's really, well, looking for alternatives, not only because of animal replacement, also because the animal animals lie, so we don't trust them. So we, we really think that this, um, um, this type of uh, systems, um, organ and chips, are going to increase patient sa safety and reduce animal experimentation. So I'm going to show you some examples of how this works. And the first one is, uh, well, in hematotoxicity. So in hematotoxicity in AstraZeneca, we have uh, this uh, bone marrow on a chip. Uh, you, we have a scaffold that uh, resembles the, the bone structure. And in that scaffold, we put um, um, hematopoietic stem cells, and they proliferate, differentiate, and uh, produce the whole hematopoietic tree, uh, regenerate, I and mean, recapitulate uh, the whole uh, bone marrow with all the different cell lineages that then you will find in the blood, like uh, red blood cells, platelets, neutrophils, so um, monocytes, lymphocytes, all of them are here, no? because we have the, the origin, uh, the common progenitor for all of them, so that the common progenitor expands and generates the, the whole um, uh, system in this chip. And then, uh, well, there's a microfluidic system in which we have some um, a medium that is uh, refreshed every th three days and it's uh, pumped uh, through, the, through the system so that uh, the, the, the scaffold is uh, refreshed with a new medium. Um, so, and then we sample uh, and uh, assess uh, that um, 
the, the, the number of cells and how the, the different lineages are developing. So we can go, it's, it's very easy to understand that the, once we have the system in the lab, we can have many of the chips working and we can do very complex experiments by adding different, adding and removing different drugs in uh, single drugs or combination of drugs just to assess how the, um, the cells are affected uh, by, by the drugs. Uh, the thing is that this, um, and this when we say, well, this is great, because uh, what we do is um, we have uh, this uh, very interesting system. And just um, let me show you the characteristics of, of the, the in vitro system. So if you see this, the human bone marrow and this, the scaffold, so it has a very, very similar uh, um, structure, physical structure, and in this, uh, in this kind of uh, caveats is uh, where the, the cells are going to, to um, form uh, the niche, the stem cell niche, and to keep um, proliferating and differentiating. Um, we know that we have all the cell lineages by single cell RNA, RNA seq uh, um, analysis, where we, we can see that uh, we have uh, red blood cells, lymphocytes, platelets, um, um, neutrophils, monocytes, so we have the whole, um, the full hematopoietic uh, tree, but the only progenitors, we don't have mature cells, we have only the progenitors that are in the bone marrow. Mature cells are in, in circulating in blood, uh, so the, this system has only the, the progenitors, it is the bone marrow, it is inside the, our bones. And also, well, we have uh, that we sample the, the circulating fluid in the, in the system that you saw in the previous slide. And the problem we have here is that, well, great, we have the bone marrow progenitors uh, here in the system, and we can assess how they, how, uh, how they move around the, the, the scaffold and how they respond to, to drugs. But then really what we have in the other, in the clinical space or setting, what we have is the number of uh, neutrophils in the in blood, I mean, counts of um, in blood cells in patients. So how to connect uh, this, what we see here, responding to the drugs with the impact um, in, uh, in, in the human, in the patients. So for that, we have mathematical models. And then in this case, we have the mathematical model of the human hematopoietic system. That means that we measure the response of the progenitors in the in vitro system here, and then we implement uh, that uh, toxicity in our uh, system, in our model for the the human hematopoietic system uh, that uh, contains all the different uh, progenitors and circulating cells too. So we have not only the progenitors, but also the circulating cells uh, that derive from those progenitors. This is what the mathematical model um, integrates. And also it uh, integrates the feedbacks from the progenitors to, from the circulating cells to their progenitors. So it's quite a complete model, and because of this mathematical model that connects um, progenitors and circulating cells, we can give predictions on the effect of the drug that we measure in this system, how the, the drug is affecting the progenitors, this part is going to reflect on this part, on the um, circulating cells, and that's called um, cytopenia risk, that it means how the um, uh, blood cell counts are going to go down uh, after the drug is administered. So, so it's quite a, quite a nice uh, setup, and we are uh, really using this uh, very often now. Um, so this, for instance, uh, yeah, one of that, um, just to, to explain further how do we do this uh, uh, translation of uh, chip toxicity into um, cytopenia risk. Uh, so we measure in the chip uh, the concentration and the, and the progenitor response. Um, so we know what is the relationship between this concentration and the, uh, the, the response of the progenitors, the, the inhibition of proliferation, if it is uh, oncotherapeutic and cancer, treat I mean cancer treatments. Then we can uh, integrate uh, that uh, relationship in the patient by understanding the the clinical uh, exposure, I mean the concentration in plasma in the patient, and this um, human hematopoietic model. Um, so we know what is uh, happening in this part, so we can uh, then uh, see how it's uh, reflected in circulating cells. And this is what we have here, the predicted uh, circulating cells in the patients regarding, um, I think these are lymphocytes, neutrophils, uh, reticulocytes, and hemoglobin. So, 
that means that uh, without before start clinical trials, if we run or we perform experiments with the drug in our in vitro system, we can we can give predictions on the response uh, of the patients to this drug at the regarding uh, blood counts, regarding the impact on the woman, and it's very important for. Uh, uh, cancer treatments, because the, one of the main toxicities in cancer treatments is um, hematotoxicities, the decrease of uh, blood counts, um, uh, platelets, neutrophils, hemoglobin, everything comes down. So, so we know that that's going to happen, but also it needs to be managed in a way. Uh, so, so you cannot really, uh, if, if uh, drugs uh, have, they have to be efficacious. So you, you have to know that the tumor is affected. Most of the times in that case, also the bone marrow is going to be affected, but it has to be affected in a way that uh, is uh, compatible with, uh, with, uh, with the treatment and with the life of uh, the patient. I mean, you cannot really, cannot be so toxic that it cannot be dosed. And this, uh, well, does it work? Our, uh, uh, this, this type of approach. So if you see here this um, carboplatin, that is a um, cancer treatment, a common one, very much used, and um, this um, a dose that is common in patients, and then you can see the platelet counts in patients, uh, so, and the neutrophil counts in patients, uh, and the black lines are the representation of the average of uh, this uh, measurements in patients that are the blue lines. And our prediction is the, the pink line. So we think uh, that we are quite close to the, to the black line. That means that um, for many molecules, we think uh, that uh, before the molecule goes into the patients, uh, we can give a very accurate prediction. So I'm just to show you how we are implementing um, this type of uh, uh, a strategy that combines um, advanced cellular systems or microphysiological systems, organoids with uh, modeling in the in AstraZeneca. So uh, these are the number of track studies in, uh, during the years in, in our team, in the team where, where I work. So when we started working on the, with this type of uh, microphysiological systems and developing the models, um, well, we used to we started with uh, two studies in the in the microphysiological system and five studies in the rat. Uh, but if you see today in 2022, uh, last year, uh, we had just one study in the rat and five studies in the in the microphysiological system, and this is uh, this reduction in the animal use um, is good. We don't like to use animals, but it's also Good because really we the microphysiological system it has a, um, improved accuracy of uh, our predictions because this is a better uh, it's, it's better in capturing the toxicity the human toxicity uh, because it avoids this uh, cross species uh, differences. So if you see here uh, in the this number of drugs that we have assessed in the system, uh, well uh, the microphysiological system has failed only in one of them. For platelets and neutrophils. Well, for instance, the, the rat, um, we have um, failure in, in platelets practically all the time. So, so, so then we, it's not only that we replace animals, it's also that we increase the quality of the predictions. So um, that's uh, well, why we are very excited about this uh, type of approaches. And just to show you just uh, very briefly how we are doing the same to assess uh, gastrointestinal toxicity using these uh, advanced cell systems. So um, oncotherapeutics, uh, well, they, they have a bone marrow toxicity. Um, that's a very, very common toxicity for cancer treatment, but also the intestinal epithelium is also very much affected. Also, if you know the skin is affected, uh, the hair is affected, all those tissues that are uh, actively proliferating are going to be affected by drugs that are inhibiting proliferation. I mean, you inhibit the proliferation of the tumor, but also you inhibit the proliferation of all these tissues that are very active. Um, the, 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 the hair or the skin, the skin can be serious because you can have rash, uh, rashes and that can be serious, but also the intestinal epithelium is very serious because um, can cause, uh, after you damage the intestinal epithelium, 
uh, you get an uh, infection, uh, inflammation, and diarrhea. And the diarrhea can be um, life threatening when it's very strong, when it's very severe. So, uh, this um, a representation of the intestinal epithelium. So, it's uh, this monolayer that uh, covers the, the mucosa. No? Here we have the villi, these are the clips, and this is the, the lumen. So, in this cartoon, what we have is that the um, this monolayer covering these structures that you see here, well, um, the stem cells, the epithelial intestinal stem cells are here in the niche that is at the base of the crypt together with panic cells. They proliferate and uh, while proliferating, their progeny uh, is pushed you know, because these are very close um, or very restricted uh, geometry. Uh, the new cells are pushed, are forced to move upwards, to migrate towards the, the villi. So it's a very dynamic system, and this push and this uh, constant proliferation and migration, uh, what it does is renewing, uh, constantly renewing. Uh, the, the cells that um, are covering or are lining our uh, uh, mucosa. And these cells uh, are shed uh, from the tip of the villi. Uh, so it's a constant production, migration, and shedding, so that we have a very dynamic, uh, uh, it's this type of system in which um, you look at the epithelium and it always looks the same, but in fact, it's never the same because it's constantly, continuously continuously being renewed. So it's a beautiful system to model for mathematical modeling. That's why the models would really like this, um, uh, this epithelium, uh, because uh, this is well, very nice to, to, to do. It's also a small number of cells um, with many different types. Uh, we have many different types of cells, so we like it. And then the other thing that we have for the epithelium are um, new technologies to assess it in vitro. Uh, because in vivo is quite difficult. Imagine that uh, in vivo to take um, biopsies of um, uh, patients uh, just to assess how the epithelium is responding to the drugs is, uh, is not possible because that's very invasive. So we, we are, uh, but now we, we have new technologies and among them is these organoids. Organoids are um, this um, a cartoon of the organoid, uh, they are a little bit like um, upside down uh, epithelium, you know, in which uh, this, this could be the crypt. You know, here we will have the crypt, and this could be the, the, the lumen. Um, so, and this could be the villi. So it's, um, it's like an inside, inside out uh, uh, epithelium. But let me show you the, the movie if it wants to start. No, now it doesn't. But, let me see. Yeah, now, uh, so, so organoids, this um, organoid are growing, and then it starts from a small number of cells that form a cyst. And then from the cyst, you get these uh, protrusions here that are the crypt domains. And the stem cells are here in the, in the base of those crypts. So that means that we have a very good system to test uh, drugs, you know, because we, we just need a kind of pre petri dish uh, with this. Uh, with the signaling molecules that uh, enable the proliferation and differentiation of uh, the formation of these uh, organoids. Also, we have um, 2D form, uh, I mean, this the, the 3D, what we call three-dimensional organoid, but also we have other uh, in vitro systems like uh, the micro tissues in which uh, well, uh, we just have a monolayer uh, of cells over a uh, stroma of mesenchymal cells, and also it can be tested uh, with drugs. Although, well, for, depending on the drug, uh, this is more um, uh, the, um, like more suitable to, un uh, to understand proliferation because it's extremely, extremely uh, proliferative, while this uh, less proliferative is more suitable for the absorption uh, assays. So, and this uh, just to show you that uh, in the same way that I was uh, doing for hematotoxicity, well, we are doing the same for the GI toxicity to predict uh, uh, clinical diarrhea associated with uh, oncotherapeutics. So, what we do is measuring these organoids in, uh, in, uh, in plates, how do they respond to different concentrations of drugs. From there, we understand the relationship between the drug concentration and the, the proliferation of the organoids. And then we use uh, a mathematical model of the human small intestinal epithelium uh, to, to understand how this relationship is disrupting proliferative cells in the crypt and how that um, results in um, 
the deficit of uh, cell migration to Asterilus, and then a deficit in the epithelium and uh, ulceration and inflammation of the epithelium and diarrhea. So from here, we can predict uh, clinical diarrhea. And this is an example of with this 5-fluoro-UACIL or 5-FQ, that is a common cancer treatment. And we predict about, um, at a given dose, uh, we are predicting at about, uh, well, 30% uh, of diarrhea in, uh, that would be um, just after dosing. And uh, the 30, well, we predict 30-32%. And with the measurements indicate, I mean, the clinical studies or the clinical trials, diarrhea is detected in 22% of the, of the cases. So we think it's quite a good prediction. And then uh, modeling well can really guide uh, dose scheduling uh, at the beginning of uh, drug development. And just to show you just the, uh, our uh, most developed uh, math, uh, computational model is a model for the intestinal epithelium. And in this case, this uh, is a case that we were discussing at the beginning. If you can know it all, you don't really need even preclinical measurements. You don't need um, rats or monkeys or advanced uh, cell systems. You just need uh, to understand uh, what's happening. And then you need a good modeler with uh, good skills to put all that moving parts uh, together in an in silico platform. And that's what we have done with uh, Louis, who works uh, with me in AstraZeneca. He's an excellent, uh, very talented modeler, but um, he has done with the intestinal epithelium. So we know how the intestinal epithelium works. We know the, the spatiotemporal uh, dynamics in the, in the crypt um, geometry. So if you see this uh, in silico representation of that proliferation, migration, and shedding uh, to the, of, of the creeps uh, to the to the lumen. This would be the column in which uh, the, the large intestine, in which we don't have uh, villi, we have only crypts. Um, and then we have all the cell lineages, we have the signaling pathways, uh, governing differentiation and proliferation. But uh, more importantly in this model, what we have done is uh, within each cell, because well, what we do is modeling each single cell in the, in the epithelium. Within each cell, we have uh, the cell cycle proteins. And we have also the dynamics of um, DNA and RNA synthesis and metabolism. And that means that uh, when we add the drugs that we know they are going to perturb, or to affect, inhibit one of the cell cycle proteins, or they are going to inhibit, DNA synthesis, we can do that in, in each single cell and see how that um, propagates uh, to the crypt uh, and to the tissue at the top, I mean, to the epithelium um, in, in the top of the, either on the villi or on the uh, surface of the large intestine and see uh, how, how that is uh, disturbed and, uh, and, and has, um, well, means that uh, we, when uh, we, we lose, when we have a, a loss of a barrier integrity because the epithelium is not there, the cells are not produced and are not there, we are going to have diarrhea and, um, and that can be life-threatening. So here in this part, uh, you can see that um, we are predicting um, epithelial injury associated with CDK1 inhibition. CDK1 is a protein of the cell cycle that uh, controls or uh, regulates the mitosis, what is the separation of the, of the, of the cells. So if the cells cannot uh, go into mitosis, uh, uh, what happens is that they become apoptotic. Uh, because um, so it's um, uh, is the apoptosis is a kind of um, suicidal uh, cell program. Um, it's, a, it's a death uh, program uh, that the cell takes because it knows it's faulty. So, and these are uh, when we so, so here will be the, the, the crypt, and these the cells in the epithelium, the different cell types in the, in the crypt, and these are the number of cells on the epithelium at the top of the. And what you can see is that we start inhibiting for four days uh, that protein, CDK1. So these gray cells that cannot divide, that's why they are big. They start, um, they, they are there in the, in the system. And then they, they, they move um, before they die, they, they move with the, but uh, because they are not dividing and many of them are affected. Uh, so we have a decrease of number of cells on the crypt, and that means a decrease of number of cells on the villi, and then diarrhea. The most important thing of this is that we are doing this predicting human epithelial injury and diarrhea 
without data at all, it's just uh, the model and the model knowledge and the understanding of the process. So, and that's, I think is, um, well, quite um, important to show that if we, we really understand everything, the modeling can be extremely useful. And then just this, my final um, slide, in which, um, well, it's, it's a comment by James Black, who was a Scottish physician and pharmacologist. And there are many uh, kind of statements like that one, but uh, well, I chose this one today, and it's, well, models in biology, what are they? Accurate description of our pathetic thinking, it means that uh, still we don't understand, and that's what is really limiting the developing of uh, good models, is that we don't understand the processes. So it's uh, data, knowledge, um, research, so we need to uh, uh, we, we need to develop new modeling platforms and technologies, but it's really very important that uh, we get a good understanding of the biology behind the, the process we want to model. So um, thank you. And I think we have only three minutes left for uh, questions, but uh, I'm very happy to, to, to answer uh, any question if, uh, or any comment or to discuss anything. Thank you, Carmen, for this interesting talk. So, time for questions. Hello, uh, this is uh, Gunnar from Lin Shopping. Um, uh, thank you for the nice presentation. I heard some of it before, actually. Um, so for these models that you talked about in the end, these agent-based models where you have intracellular signaling and metabolism and you build up and you have this sort of stochastic looking simulations, uh, is, was there any type of validation based on those simulations? Or was it just output of the model, so to say? Um, yes, well, uh, the validation if you mean comparison with data, yes. we have done that at, at, uh, yes, at different, the things that the model has many, many scales. So, and we don't have data for all the scales. We have data for the number of cells in the crypt and in the dilus, and we, we, we can see that um, uh, not, not in the CDK1 that I represented, because, uh, well, that's something we are, uh, that's quite new, but uh, we have done it for DNA damage, uh, for the example with 5FU that I presented with the ODE models, but we have the same with the agent-based model, and we can see that at the cell composition level, yes, it agrees, um, and at the diarrhea risk, also agrees. So the, the, the problem with the models sometimes is that it's true, we have many assumptions and hypotheses, and, uh, and we cannot even, uh, uh, there are many scales that we cannot validate because there are no data available, and uh, there, there will not be data in the, in the near future. future. But um, at, uh, at the scales at which uh, we gather data, we, we validate and we refine the model if we see that it doesn't agree. So that brings me a little bit to my second question, which is, so, so you have all of these many scales and you have all of these details, how, and, and you don't have any data for those. Uh, so how do you prevent error accumulation? Uh, so, so if you have sort of small errors in many lower models, uh, yeah, 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 but uh, yes, of course, I mean, it's, uh, it, but, but that's why we, what we do is uh, wherever, uh, for, for us, um, what is, uh, we have the model and it's a beautiful abstract um, complex a series of concepts that we need to tie down to, to, to the earth, no? Um, yes. <laughs> down to earth. And what we do is we, whenever we have data, whenever we can see that we can get data, either in literature or in, or it, it cannot be, and it doesn't have to be quantitative data, also qualitative about behaviors, you know, dynamical behaviors. We try to, the model to recapitulate, uh, to check that it recapitulates whatever data qualitative or quantitative, uh, it's there. And that's exactly for, for that reason. We know that with 
all these uh, beautiful, um, complex, uh, large models, we can really go very wrong when things accumulate. So, but that's why what we, so, so we, we do the molecular scale. We try to, to understand if we are uh, at least represented, representing the right dynamics of the uh, cycle proteins. And for that, we have some data. We do the cellular scale. We have some data on how the, uh, the, the composition of the clip and, and the spa spatio-temporal uh, dynamics. So we, we validate it. And then also we have some data about how that uh, reflects into a diarrhea. So we, we compare uh, predictions with observations as much as possible at, uh, at, uh, at the scales at which uh, we can uh, gather data. So we, 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 are, we are very... Uh, and the thing is that... Uh, uh, in, in academia, or in, it's, it's important to compare uh, data observations with predictions. For us, working with patients, it's really, really important that we don't we don't get it wrong. So, so we really are focused on on just uh, doing models that um, uh, embrace the, the complexity, but also models that um, are uh, accurate. More questions. Thank you. This is Giorgio Davico from the University of Bologna. Uh, I wanted to ask you one thing because it was mentioned in a couple of slides that you could use AI and machine learning methods throughout the drug development process. But how do the regulators, such as the European Medicines Agency, see the use of these methods, like in the drug development? Like, they do, do they accept evidences from AI or? What? Uh, I, yeah, I don't know about that because I, I don't work, um, I mean, I don't know specifically how, what is the position of the, um, uh, uh, of the EMEA or of the FDA um, with AI methods. Um, yeah, no, okay, the, so the you... That, uh, the, the things that you can, uh, you can use it and it's used very much uh, because it's a way of uh, understanding um, and, and discovering new new uh, targets and new molecules and new structures. Um, but then uh, what they require in regulatory bodies, usually what they require are proof that you have this molecule and that molecule is uh, safe and it's efficacious. They don't really mind how you find the molecule. But, you know, in a way, it's, um, once you get the molecule, um, they, 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 if if uh, you you go to to discover that molecule with uh, AI and machine learning methods, that shouldn't be a a problem at all. Um, I don't know if uh, yeah. where, where we are having problems is when we want to su submit, uh, uh, for instance, as, as proof of uh, safety, just a prediction, like uh, we are doing in the cardiac space. Then is when really the regulatory bodies are not used to that because they want uh, data, not predictions. But in the case of um, in the discovery uh, that is very early in development, you, 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 it's, it's open for you to to use all the uh, technologies that you can use. Yeah, yeah, okay. So I guess it's, it depends on where in the drug development oh, process you would yes. use it. Okay, yeah. thank you. If you use it for submission to regulatory agencies, that's another story. And that's, they are not used to that, and uh, that's quite difficult. Yeah, okay, can, thank you. It can be that you delay the project. Yeah. Um, I just had a question about determining the right dose before entering clinical trials. Um, what are some strategies that are available for determining whether there's a drug-drug interaction that would affect whether the concentration is within that therapeutic index? Are there any potential ways to kind of navigate that and model that? Yes, yes, that's um, the main use of uh, these PBPK models, pharmaco um, uh, physiologically based uh, pharmaco um, pharmacokinetics models. Um, the, the big model that I um, show you, well, first, there are a few in vitro assessments uh, that you can do. Uh, so you know that if the drug uh, has common um, uh, clearance um, pathways, uh, two drugs then can interact with each other. I, I think that's what you meant uh, about drug-drug interactions. Is yes. that what you are? Uh, 
Yes, no? Yes, exactly. So, so yes. So, so yes, no, that, that's very, very important. Much more with, because now it's very frequent, uh, very frequently we use, um, we combine the drugs, no? And the first, and the most important and the first thing to do is to understand uh, the interactions uh, between drugs. So first is um, you, you have to understand the metabolism of the drug, and you can do that in advance by understanding the, the clearance in in vitro systems of those drugs. Um, and then you can predict, uh, you see these, um, these uh, models that are complex um, about um, uh, the pharmacokinetics, the physiologically based pharmacokinetics, how the drugs, uh, how one drug is going to affect the clearance or the metabolism of the other, and then the, the, the clearance from the body. And now uh, we get predictions before uh, clinical trials uh, for that. And predictions are, um, are not bad, uh, but the important thing is that they improve um, constantly, so the models are in, under constant development and improvement. But that's one of the first things uh, assessed uh, that, that need to be assessed in, in drug development. The drug drug interactions is, is a, um, a very big uh, work in the clinical stage. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Okay, so we should end. So thank you, Carmen, once again for the talk. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much to all of you.